We now come to the next section of Deuteronomy. If we reflect on it with the structure of the ancient uh, Near Eastern treaties, we now come to what has been known as the, the specific stipulations. We've had the general stipulations, chapter 5 through 11. Chapter 12 following uh, now gives those details. It's the details that the suzerain is requiring. When it comes to uh, these in Deuteronomy, we see uh, three repeated themes through all of the laws. The first two we've mentioned already, we're to love God and we're to love our neighbour. But there's another one, and that is to love the stranger and the foreigner. You may remember at different times in these books of the Torah, God reminds Israel that they were strangers in Egypt, they were slaves in Egypt, and therefore it's as if they know what it's like to be an alien. And God wanted foreigners uh, to be welcome in Israel and protected and looked after. Uh, There's a a, a number of scholars that have recognised or at least seen a pattern in this part of Deuteronomy that the laws aren't so random as they may seem, uh, but rather they're grouped together in clusters that are actually unpacking the different of the commandments. And uh, on the screen there, you'll see uh, the table with these particular, uh, with this particular structure. And uh, I've looked at this, and I think, uh, particularly for the first commandments, this this fits pretty well. As we go on to some of the last commandments, I don't think it does fit so well. But nonetheless, this is uh, the the, the platform we will use to explore this particular uh, part of Deuteronomy. And so uh, we come to chapter 12, and uh, the the first two commandments, of course, are loving God and, and loving your neighbor. And this seems to be borne out in chapter 12 of Deuteronomy, which is actually a really important chapter. Because in this chapter, it talks about something has been repeated over and over again, and that is when they go into the land, they are to demolish every worship place. But there's something going on here that is really important for you to understand, not just for Deuteronomy, but for the rest of the Old Testament. And that is that God required Israel to have only one place of worship. This is known as the centralization of worship, centralizing worship in one place. Now, the Canaanite deities, they were localized. They worshipped Baal, but the Baal was localized into many different places. And uh, the same with uh, the Ashtaroth worship. Each town would have their own uh, representative of Baal or Ashtaroth. And, uh, and the, the thinking was that these gods controlled that particular area. And, uh, and God, when he was bringing his people into the Promised Land, he wanted to renew their minds. He wanted them to have a whole different perspective to understand that, that he, Yahweh, was not another localized God that should be put alongside the other ones, but rather he was the God of the whole earth. And uh, he was a God who was, who was everywhere. He fills the whole the heavens and all the earth. And so they were to destroy all the worship places, we read in chapter 12, verse 2. And then, when they've got rid of all of these localized pagan worship places, they would put the tabernacle at the place that God would choose, and that would be one place where they were to worship. And uh, three times a year, they were to gather as a people to that particular place for these festivals, but it was one place. And this pray and this phrase. Uh, that we first find in, in chapter 12, verse 5, but you shall seek the place that the Lord your God will choose out of all your cities, uh, and you shall go there to bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices. This phrase, the place that the Lord will choose, you will notice 
is repeated many times. And this becomes a very important feature of Israel's worship. The time uh, that they had uh, localized worship places that led them into uh, idolatry. When you come to the kings, you will find uh, that there are some of the kings of Judah, they were really good kings. It says that they, they, they followed the, the ways of the Lord, but they did not destroy the high places. Now, uh, when it says that about a good king, it's not talking about the high places of idolatry. It's talking about high places that have been created to worship Yahweh. When it comes to uh, the division of the kingdom, you'll discover there in, in 1 Kings uh, uh, chapters 11 and 12, when the, southern, uh, when the northern kingdom separated from the southern kingdom, Jeroboam I, uh, who was the, 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 the king of that northern kingdom, he had a problem because now there were two nations, but the place that God had chosen to worship was in Jerusalem. And uh, rather than honour that foundational law that we find here in Deuteronomy 12 and let his people go to Jerusalem to worship and trust God that God will protect his throne, rather than do that, he built uh, his own places of worship. And all the way through kings, you'll find every king after him in the northern kingdom was judged on whether they... um, uh, they removed these idolatrous worship places or not. Because God had said, you worship at one place. And so chapter 12 of Deuteronomy becomes a big moment in Israel's history uh, because this law was going to have repercussions all the way through. And of course, as I've said, this law, like many others, is there to try to protect Israel from the syncretism, from the idolatry of the localized uh, uh, Canaanite cultures. Uh, There's, uh, uh, because of this law, there's one change. Leviticus 17 says that when any of the uh, the people there in the wilderness wanted to eat meat, they should take their animal to the entrance of the tender meeting and slaughter it there and then take it and it would be uh, kind of like a peace offering. They would be able to eat the meat and and, and have their celebration. Uh, But of course, when they settle in the land uh, to have this law, which again, by the way, was to protect people from idolatry, uh, freshly out of Egypt, uh, a very important law for that. But when they settle the land, of course, this is an impossible law to obey if you're in the north of of Galilee to come all the way down to to uh, uh, Shiloh or to G- uh, Gilgal or Jerusalem as it eventually became the place that God would choose to to come to this place to have your animal slaughtered and then take the meat back well uh, it would be inedible by the time you got back and so there is a change and uh, what we read in verse 15 is that people are free to eat meat. The important thing is they do the right thing with the blood. And so when it comes to specific laws, there's some detailed laws laws there about loving God and about not uh, having graven images, very practical ways of worshipping God alone. Uh, But then when we come to uh, chapter 13, uh, we have... Uh, a, a set of laws that are related to not taking the name of the Lord your God in vain. Uh, chapter 13 is uh, divided into three. You'll notice it addresses prophets, it addresses family members, and it addresses cities. And in each case, it has to do whether these entities are seducing people into idolatry. And uh, it's interesting because it even speaks about uh, those who do this are guilty of treason. And, uh, and this is uh, uh, because they, are, they have entered into a covenant with God. He was their suzerain. He was their king. Uh, 
And then if people are going after other gods, it really is uh, like treason. And so he says uh, uh, to them, if a prophet, uh, uh, even a prophet who prophesies accurately and works miracles, does signs and wonders, if this prophet says, let's follow after other gods, you shall not listen to them, but rather you should expose them and they should be executed. And it's verse 5 that speaks about them having spoken treason. And so they're taking God's name in vain because they're claiming to speak from God, but it's actually uh, false. And they're leading a people astray. Uh, verse 6 following talks about family members, whether it's your brother your, uh, or, or any kind of family member, if they are leading you into idolatry, you should show no pity or compassion. You shall not shield them, but rather they should be executed. Because this was so serious. As you continue to work your way through the Old Testament, you will discover very quickly that this thing of idolatry in the nation of Israel it, it, it was kind of like a cancer. You are aware, I'm sure, of, of the, just the destructive nature of cancer. It gets in the body and it grows and grows and grows and eventually it, 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 kills, the pa it kills the patient. And, uh, and idolatry in Israel was just like that. Uh, and it did eventually destroy the nation in 586 BC when Nebuchadnezzar uh, destroyed all the cities of Judah and indeed Jerusalem. And so we see we're dealing with something here very serious. It, it isn't just a matter of personal ethics or personal belief. It is something that will get in and uh, really destroy the people. And so in the same way as uh, today someone who has cancer may have a really intrusive surgery uh, to try and cut that cancer out, try to remove it. So, uh, uh, so we see here, God is saying, if a family member even wants to lead you into idolatry, they should not be shielded, which of course is a temptation, but they should be exposed and they should uh, be executed. And likewise, a town, if a whole town uh, is uh, moving into idolatry. And it's interesting in verse 14 that it says they should make inquiry and thorough investigation to make sure this is true. And if it is true, they should attack that town, uh, but there should be no plunder taken. And this is interesting because no one should gain personally from the plunder of that town because the point isn't to attack a town so you become more wealthy. The point was to take away this cancer that was beginning to grow in the nation. And so we see here the, uh, the urgency of people being free from uh, idolatry. Uh, we then come to uh, a, a chapter... Of 14, oh, so, sorry, just to say there's some other laws here. There's that repetition of, um, of the laws of Leviticus about food that is clean and unclean. And this, of course, is uh, much shorter here as it is a restatement of that law. And uh, this is a, a, an interesting law. Uh, people have asked lots of questions as to why this was the case. One of the things we can be certain of is that, as it says in Leviticus, that these laws are designed to keep uh, Israel as holy. We read there that God says, I, the Lord your God, am holy, therefore you sh should be holy. And, and the very fact that the, these kosher food laws were part of the culture of Israel, one thing it did was it kept them as a separate and a distinct people. And uh, there may well have been other benefits as well, health benefits and other benefits, but they, they, they were a distinct people. And what is interesting 
is as you look at the history of Israel, and particularly when it comes to the period just before Jesus, these food laws became very important. And, uh, and it was something that keep Israel and, and the Jewish people uh, separate and uh, as a, a coherent entity. But what is also interesting is when Jesus came, he was the one uh, who said in Mark uh, 7, the commentary of Mark 7, whereby these food laws are no longer in force. Uh, thus, Jesus declares all foods clean. We have in uh, Acts 10 the vision of um, Peter. And, and all these things are pointing to the fact that because uh, Israel had fulfilled its destiny in the person of Jesus, that perfect Israelite who fulfilled the whole law perfectly, because that had come to a conclusion, now this kind of distinctiveness was not uh, significant anymore. Because a, a true Jew, as we're told in Romans, it are those who put their faith in, a, uh, like Abraham, who put their faith in Christ, and so, um, uh, or our people of faith, and so uh, we have these restated, and then uh, we come to uh, some very interesting tithing passages in chapter twenty-two, uh, sorry, fourteen, verse twenty-two. We have a tithe here that uh, is a tithe that's not often spoken about because it's not the normal kind of tithe. When people talk about tithing, they usually refer to the tithe that's mentioned in Leviticus 27 and Numbers 18. This is when the tithe is given to the priest uh, or the Levites, and then the Levites tithe to the high priestly family. And so uh, the purpose of the tithe uh, it was like a tax in Israel to enable the Levites to do their work and they in turn tithe to the high priest so that the high priestly family could do their work. And um, so that is the tithe that's normally spoken about. Uh, regarding tithing and whether tithing is applicable today, some have argued because tithing predated the law and was in the Old Testament in Genesis, then it, it, it is applicable today. We do read that Abraham, he paid a tithe to Melchizedek. And, uh, and we do find that, of course. He did do that. There's no evidence that he did it uh, as a course of his whole life. We just have this one incident of what he did. Uh, but he did do that. But in the same way, circumcision predated the law. And this is something that was introduced, uh, you'll know, at Abraham's time. But when we come to the New Covenant, we don't find circumcision uh, comes into the New Covenant just because it was before the law, but rather um, it is no longer applicable uh, because circumcision, uncircumcision, as the Apostle says, uh, the Apostle Paul says, these things aren't significant now. The important thing is circumcision of the heart. That is the thing that's important. And so when it comes to this tithing issue, I would suggest the issue is not whether we tithe, not whether we're obligated to give a tenth of our income and we have to wrestle, is it before tax, after tax, and it has to go to one location, but rather it has to do with generosity. When Jesus spoke about money, he spoke about generosity. When the Apostle Paul spoke about money, when especially in, in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, the repeated words there are generosity, freedom, not under compulsion, but giving freely. And so rather than being people that are doing a mathematical calculation, uh, rather we should uh, be generous in our giving and uh, have a generous heart to support the local church, to support missions and to uh, care for the poor and needy. These are areas that are mentioned in the New Covenant and uh, it, it, it comes out of a heart of generosity. Now, interestingly enough, I think this is a, an example where the Old Testament can give us wisdom. Because as we think about our finances and how we're going to give, the question is, how, how do we decide what to give? And I would suggest a tenth is a good starting point. 
when you're starting out, why not have a tent? That's a good place to start, not as an obligation, not as trying to keep some stipulation, but rather as a beginning point of generosity and giving. And I mention that because uh, often this is a question that is um, uh, asked, and I believe the model I presented is a good way to look at this. But the, the tithe we have here is not about that tithe, it is a different tithe. Uh, some people like to call this the rejoicing tithe, because in this tithe, it's not money that you give, but it's money that you, you actually use for yourselves. It speaks there about taking this particular tithe to the place that the Lord your God will choose, and then you take this tithe, and remember, tithing at this time wasn't money, it was produce, it was animals. It was the result of your harvest. Take it and join together in celebration. And I think here we have uh, uh, God uh, creating, creating provision for the times, the three times a year when the people of Israel were to gather together either at the tabernacle or later on at the temple. And this was a way of financing that particular trip, that they were able to uh, take this tithe and, and they enjoyed the benefits of this tithe themselves and their families and they included, uh, of course, the, uh, the Levite and the orphan, the widow, the resident alien. In other words, there was a welcome to everybody to enjoy this particular uh, situation, this particular celebration. But the point is, it was a time when they were able to celebrate. And one thing I've noticed about the religious system in the Old Testament is the repeated word is rejoice. Only one day of the year should they mourn the Day of uh, Atonement. One day should they fast, again, uh, the Day of Atonement. The rest of the times, it was feasting and celebration. And uh, this speaks of God's heart for his people, ancient people then, and I've no doubt for people today. Taking a portion of finances, enjoying the, the pleasure and the delight of that is something we see here. Just lastly, before we... Uh, finish uh, this particular session. Notice verse 28, we have yet another tithe. And so when it comes to tithing, it's not just one tithe that we often think, it's a tithe of um, to the Levites, a tithe for the celebration feasts, but here a third tithe, which is a three-year tithe. This tithe is brought into the towns and it is put in the storehouse and is put there for the vulnerable. Uh, we read here for the Levites because uh, they don't have their own uh, farms and for the resident aliens, the orphans and the widows and this is where they can eat. In other words, this was part of the social structure to protect the vulnerable, the needy, maybe the disabled, the aged, the infirmed, those who were no longer able to go out and farm for their own food. This was a place where they could eat. And uh, it's interesting to me how in a number of nations this whole uh, ministry of a food bank are, uh, banks are coming up where people are bringing food and then those in great need are being uh, uh, directed towards them. Surely it would be best if this wasn't needed, uh, but in many places it is needed. And here we see this tithe serving that purpose. Now, one of the things that's unsure, are these the same tithes uh, appropriated in different ways, or are they um, different tithes altogether? Is, was the tithe 10% or was it uh, 23 and a third percent? and uh, uh, different interpreters would say different things. But for us, because we are not under this law, uh, that answer to that doesn't matter too much, but rather the different principles that we see and the heart of God expressed in these different tithes. That's what's important, and that is what we can bring into our lives and see applicable.